Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our second Saturday composing workshop. And today uh, we were talking about uh, participating in a STEM STEAM workshop coming up, and we realized uh, uh, we haven't really done done something based on the prompt of engineering, some concept related to engineering. So uh, in discussing this, uh, Peter mentioned that he had written a piece inspired by the first analytical difference engine, the, the earliest computer invented. Um, and so we thought that was a cool topic. And then he's going to talk us through how he uh, composed his piece. So I'm just going to share this image. And then I'll, so this is um, Countess Ada Lovelace who was the daughter of Lord Byron and a mathematician. And in the early 1800s, she collaborated closely with uh, Charles Babbage, who is considered the father, the inventor of the um, modern computer. And she wrote the first computer program to run on the analytical difference engine. So of course, with computers, you can have a physical machine, but if you don't have an algorithm, if you don't got nothing really. So the computer programming was a very important part of it. And we thought that was a cool story to share. And um, so I'm going to turn it back to Peter so he can show us uh, a little video that inspired his composition. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so probably it was 2005, 2006 or so. I just happened upon, I believe it was this video on YouTube, but somebody had built a model of the of the Babbage difference engine. And um, there are a few of these online, so you can take a look at them. And they're just fascinating to watch about how all these drums and rotating mechanics, you think of the evolution of clockwork into computing, uh, how, to, how you would program them and how they can compute results. So I'll play just a little clip of this. Hopefully, in that, you can hear a little bit of the rhythm of the machine, the, the sounds that it makes. And what happens is that one phase of computation happens, and then these cylinders, these drums shift, and another phase happens. And that's actually very similar to how computers still work. They do things in cycles, and at every cycle, they compute one thing, and then move, then shift data around, and then compute the next thing. Um, so it's very interesting to think about how our modern computers made up of very, very small transistors still have a similar process to how a mechanical computer from a couple hundred years ago worked, or the early 1800s. Um, and that rhythm, that sound of the boom as the cylinders shift and then the, they spin and compute the one value and then shift again, uh, inspired me to create a hyperscore piece that I entitled the Countess of Lovelace after Ada Byron. So I'll play this piece and then you can then we can uh, dissect it and take a look at how it was put together. But hopefully in this piece, like in the video, you'll hear that that kind of cyclic mechanical rhythm.
So let's take a look at what's happening here. So the, the core of this is that rhythm. And it's like that da, 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 da. So if you look at these, um, let's look at these three motives here, the orange, the dark blue, and the light blue, you'll see where that rhythm actually kind of is embedded in the piece. So we have just one short note on the downbeat, and then the higher, a couple of intervals higher. And together, and if we come down here into the sketch window, I can highlight just a few of these strokes to listen only to those strokes. And we'll hear those two uh, melody windows interacting. And that's kind of the basis for the piece. Now there's some modulations here. You can see as these uh, light blue move around a little bit, that gives us our chord progression. So we can build up a chord progression uh, by layering strokes from different notes. There's a couple of ways of doing chords in hyperscore, but in this version, I think it was actually before polyphonic melody windows that we have today existed. So the only way back when I wrote this to create chords was to layer different strokes together. And by doing that, by moving them a little bit, I can change the chord that's created. And let's just go through the end here so you can hear that whole chord progression. And that is repeated. If you look at that, those light and dark blue notes. That's just repeated that sequence kind of over and over again throughout the whole piece. So that's the basis of the whole piece, and right? Until we get to the end here, then something different happens. Uh, listen to that. Uh, the timbre also changes. It goes from from legato strings to arco strings to pizzicato and a little diminuendo, but that changes right at the end. But that's the backbone of this piece. And then on top of that, we have these dark green, which I saw those, and nice timpani that marks the beginning of each cycle. And actually, the, that particular interval reminds me of another song. I'll leave it as an exercise to the viewer to see if it sounds familiar to anybody. And that's right here in this green melody window. So. One thing to think about when you're building up melody windows is that they can be sparse, that they can be little bits and accents or, or emphasis on certain, to, to give phrasing um, to a piece. So they don't have to be as dense as actual melodies. They can be used in, in different ways. And speaking of the actual melodies, now that we've covered like the, the green and the, the light blue and dark blue windows, we can see that there's some other things that are happening here. So this orange is an additional kind of chord that comes in when it's layered together with these other pieces. Over here, but up here, I'm also using it in a much shorter way as kind of these little glockenspiel accents. So that's not quite melody, but when we look at the, the longer lines in the piece, so this purple and red and the light green and the yellow, we start to see some melody. So actually this yellow is kind of a, a baseline. So we'll come back to that, but let's look at the melody. 
So we see here that the purple is always succeeded by a red. And the way that the, the reason that I did that um, is again a variation. So we want to repeat this purple one a few times, but have it end differently. So we have this. Melody. see is that that repeats it's hard to see the repeat marker you can see it on this one um that repeats one and a half times but then these last two bars are replaced by the red melody so together they create one melodic line in the piece Doing that is a great technique for creating variations. Um, sometimes you just want to take a whole window like this and duplicate it, and then you can create a variation on it. You can change the color, or you can reuse colors, and that's a, a useful technique to get more interest and variety in the piece while still keeping the same shape and the same uh, melodic idea. But you can change just a few notes, and it'll make a, a difference. And then we have this green, light green line. And what you'll see here is that it doesn't play in this first statement here. So we have the first section of the piece. It comes in in the second section up here with a flute. And then we go back to the A theme, which is the purple and the red, but this green B theme gets moved to a clarinet and an octave lower. So it takes place underneath the theme that we already heard. And much like the analytic engine itself, these those rotating drums with their spokes intermeshing these two melodies weave together. And lastly, we have the yellow, which I said was kind of like a bass line. You see it down here an octave below middle C that's stated, and it's in the piano too. And it's a melodic sort of bass line. It's not just chordal notes. So it's very much connected to the theme. And if you actually look at it in conjunction with the screen theme, you can see that rhythmically they're somewhat similar. You get these two 16th notes here and here. Um, yeah, there's a rhythmic correspondence. And lining up your melody windows like this, so you can see those patterns there. And I wonder if I actually made this by copying it and making a variation of it just to have the, the rhythm and the contour be somewhat similar. Yeah, so when you put these things together. And that same yellow line goes under the A theme, the purple red. But I think that what really brings this piece together is that 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 persistent cyclic rhythm through the whole thing. Let's play it one more time.
really, really charming. And I would love to see it now, like spliced into that video clip. I don't know if you oh, yeah. have trouble with the. <laughs> yeah. It's a tri tribute. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, Peter. I'm curious okay. about if the process you went, if you can, if you recall the process you went with composing, if it was um, how you broke down these different elements and what decisions you made at the time to kind of like where you started with this. I definitely started with the rhythm because I saw that video and I heard that rhythm and it just was so interesting to me. So that's where this piece definitely began. And I'm trying to remember the melody that came up around it, like putting myself in, I mean, 1830, what was it, 1830, 1840 or so, and putting myself in that mindset, but with, I mean, it's very optimistic theme. Um, yeah, it, it wanted something that sounded a little nostalgic, a little period in its kind of liltiness. Uh, I definitely thought about that. Um, and like the, the the birth of this whole field of computing. So looking back on that with that kind of uh, admiring hindsight, uh, wanted to capture a bit of that. I probably wrote the purple red, um, this A section first, and then probably the yellow under that, and then the green, light green would have been the last section. And I do remember thinking about, oh, do I put this again in this, when I restate the A section, and I kind of went up and back about it, and I had to tweak this melody a bit to make it fit in with the uh, purple red melody, but then it worked and kept it like that. It's really cool how it works both as a B section, also as a counter melody against the A yeah. section. Yeah. No, it's really well done. I think I hear the daintiness of, if you're thinking about Ida in the 1800s, there's a dainty quality to it. And that's one of the things I love about your melodies. Can you tell us why you chose to do groups of three? Is the machine actually operating in a rhythmic pattern of three? I don't know that it's necessary I mean that's the rhythm that I heard and the way that I heard the rhythm and it's interesting you, I hadn't even remembered or noticed that but you're right it's in three four um so I guess it has like a, a, a mechanical waltz like quality almost it's the da 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 da, da um, which is like a slight shift on the, the waltz type rhythm but um yeah, it's just the the way I heard the 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 stresses in the mechanical sounds. It fits well with, as you say, the optim the period, mm -hmm. and the optimism. I mean, Waltz, I, you'd say, is an optimistic. <laughs> yeah, I think it was cool as you were talking. If we if we think of this as related to engineering, you were using words like um, sparse and dense. And when I think about structures that are, you know, sometimes a, a structural will be minimalistic and sometimes it'll have lots of things going on in it. But it's really cool that your blues are mm -hmm. right through the middle of the piece. So like the, the filler between the, the melodies at the top and the bottom. And it's like, so you have different uses of materials, but that structure is yeah. all the way through the middle. So that struck me as very engineering like as I was listening yeah. to the piece play. Yeah, definitely. It is the the backbone or the skeleton or the armature upon which everything else is attached. And you know, I, just looking back at the original inspiration here, the video, you see that there's this exterior structure and then the structure of the drums, but the, what's happening in each drum is kind of different. It's kind of like the melodies as they interlock and, and mesh together. Um, so yeah, having that 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 core, that backbone, both conceptually and musically and metaphorically. It's really interesting. I hadn't thought of it quite that way, but yeah. I guess as a composing strategy, that's mm -hmm. 
pretty important. I mean, to have some scaffold or, you know, backbone, as you say, it could be rhythmic, it could be a narrative kind of transformation mm -hmm. or shape. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be rhythmic, but a lot of pieces do use a rhythmic kind of backbone or scaffold, then you build your piece around it. I think that's that's a really, I think, a helpful co concept for our budding composers out there to like you put that in place, then you build other things around it. You're gonna, it'll help you have a more a coherent sounding piece. For sure. Yeah. yeah. It's like to have some idea that's the core of the piece and everything else is built off of that or an elaboration of it or a variation of it. And in this case, it's rhythm and a lot of popular music that the rhythm is pretty consistent throughout. You might have a bridge where the rhythm changes, but that rhythm sets the the, the, the base of the music and then the melody gets attached to that. And then there's also the structure of the piece. You've got kind of the A, B, B prime structure of this with a with an intro and a and a conclusion, a coda at the end, where this last section repeats. So the, here the red section in the A section, the red section we hear once, but in this conclusion here, we hear the red section twice with the diminuendo and the slight change of orchestration and taking out that that yellow counter melody. So there's many different types of structure. There's the backbone, there's the, the formal structure, the intro A, B, B, or A prime coda, and then the harmonic and melodic relationships. Interesting. When you were showing us the purple line and then the red line, at first I thought, well, why did you choose to have them be separate? motives rather than just have one long melodic line mm -hmm. then when you break out the red as a separate thing you can then real you know reuse it so somewhere you're, you're thinking this could this should be a module you know like right yeah which is also an important engineering concept like what what is the smallest unit that you can reuse mm -hmm. and where do you need to break it to reuse it the way that you want to reuse it so those two things they do they're very much related and oftentimes they're connected, but they're not always connected. The second yeah. time through the purple, you don't want those last two bars. You want the red three bars and then that red three bars can be reused. And that's probably like structuring it that way. That's probably how that coda came to exist in the first place. Had I not broken it up like that, and I probably would not have thought to repeat the coda, to repeat the red three bars twice to get that coda but had because i made that decision earlier on in the composing process it gave me the idea of something to do when i was putting it together at the end but i think that means you had in your mind this idea that often the endings of a phrase are changed in a very yeah. that's one of those degrees of freedom that you, you wanted to have and um and, and yeah i like that going back to like you know what is this teach you about engineering I think you know you want useful you, you want to design things where the units um kind of give you a certain kind of efficiency I suppose and um because you could say well the the smallest unit in music might be the individual note <laughs> right but if you did that then you would have to be you know that's not very efficient if you have certain patterns that are going to be reused so you turn that into a, a part <laughs> you know you build yeah exactly and there's a couple in, in computer programming there's this idea of modularity and encapsulation and reuse that you can have small units like in programming you write functions and a function ideally should do one thing but then you write functions that call other functions and the way that you assemble those functions of those blocks of code create addition, new functionality by connecting them together. And that's very, very, very similar to the process that's happening here. And 
yet some of these, like the yellow, it's a long motive because that functions as entire one entire idea, one thought. So it needs to be long. There's no reason to break that up into smaller bits. The red and the purple, they're what there turned out to be a reason to get that change at the end. Um, and then you have these smaller little bits that are used in in different ways. Like the blue is just the downbeat. The, the the light blue is the the backbeat kind of the da, 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 da part. The orange is used in two different ways, just for the sake of using it. You have the full statement of it here. But then I just use a short version of it as incidental notes. I could have made these dots, perhaps. And actually, there's a reason that they're not dots, which is that I, by making them uh, a motive, I was able to get it an octave higher than I could by just putting a dot mm -hmm. in here, which it would sound as written. So, but that was a, in this case, this is perhaps not good engineering because I'm using this in two completely different ways. Maybe it should have been another melody window of its own to create these small bits, but. I would yeah. congratulate you on using your materials in different ways. I think that's something an engineer yeah. has to come up with. <laughs> so I, I I see something interesting um, that you might speak about, Peter, is mm -hmm. your decision to put the yellow and the green throughout the bottom. It it made me think of beams since I was thinking of structure anyway or engineering. It, like their structural beams supporting the whole piece because they cross over the A section into your bridge and um, but they're just throughout the whole thing. What was your thoughts there? Um, what in the bot? You mean the bottom? These putting the windows on the bottom here. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. The yellow one, it kind of makes sense. It's a it's part of this baseline anyway so it might make sense i think it might just be that they're longer windows so to make sure that too many things didn't overlap there was room for them to go all the way across at their full length at the bottom whereas if i try to fit them in the top some of these other windows might be on top of them or then they'd be way up here where i wouldn't be able to see them and the sketch window at the same time that's more of a logistical like, reason uh, i think it's a relationship between the yellow and the light green um, so maybe you did it that way to make sure they would yeah. fit together, you know? Th that yeah, and I probably composed the, uh, the uh, I think the yellow first and then the light green probably right after that. So there, it actually, the structure of this perhaps reflects a little bit of its, the process of its creation too. In what order did I compose things? I composed the rhythm first and these are the first three windows the orange light blue and dark blue that I created then I did the purple red and so you're kind of building out as I'm adding windows in uh, and purple red is kind of that's your sort of theme your, yeah. your dominant melody and then you kind of probably looked at the yellow and said okay what works with that mm -hmm. that's a, kind of a, a second voice um which I, you know, I'm thinking back on last week, what we tried to do, which was kind of interesting experiment. We learned from every experience. We took a prose poem and we said, what would it be like to set this to music? So we sort of picked a few lines because the long, poem was much longer than we ever have any hope of <laughs> getting through. But we picked a first, you know, first couple of lines kind of, tried reading it out in different ways and then tried to match that rhythmically and then and tonally to how one would read that line and that, and that was really interesting and fun and then we did the second line and then we did the third line and then we were trying to um put them together and there were some interesting kind of juxtapositions that kind of just came out of it just by chance but there were also mm -hmm. things that were like pretty random or kind of like so, so I think uh, the challenge we had then, if we were to go back, I'd say like, okay, maybe we need to um, figure out the scaffolding. It's like we mm -hmm. kind of started with maybe the the outer surface almost in a way, right. and had I don't know. Does that? What do you think, Nora? <laughs> since you were there, so. yeah, I think it was an interesting 
challenge to kind of try with try to make motives that we could then use against each other in kind of a prose poem where it was moving from one to another and I think that I had the hope when we were composing that it would be something that we could then have each line kind of interpose against each other but I think that because the meter was such that I mean, there wasn't a meter in the prose poem so and it, it didn't really line up consistently against each other so it's hard to make kind of a a tonal motivic piece that was like that had that kind of like melody counter melody interlocking thing that maybe I was one some parts of me were wanting to hear um so we ended up with something a little bit more dissonant <laughs> which is interesting in its own way but definitely might, yeah. might have been yeah. it was interesting I, I would love to revisit it at a future thing because what another thing I noticed a lot with um word music that's set to words is often the words are repeated the phrase is repeated multiple times if you look at a you know a cantata or something you know and, and you know it's interesting you on the program you read what the words are and they go like wait they're just repeating this one over and over you know for, like, for three minutes before they move on to the next thing and uh so uh it's it's interesting i, I haven't really thought more about musically why the people why, why they would do that but in, repeat it so that they can create that kind of musical repetition where it doesn't exist in the text yeah. or to pad out the text until it gets back into the <laughs> maybe it's the pad out. but i felt like like if you just do it once like it flies by too fast like mm -hmm. i i you know so one of the first things mm -hmm. i like do is go back and like repeat those motives and play with them and let them really kind of sink in you know like and then as you know Nora was saying you know, like we probably ought to also think about the the rhythmic structure so even though it's a prose poem there's no inherent meter we might have to figure one out and and I think it'd be more successful if we had that kind of structure and then we can start to put in the the um, motives that we came up with or we might adjust the motive so they you know so anyway that would be an interesting exercise to go back to <laughs> i i wanted to ask you as the artist who made that peter um i was thinking about something like the vietnam memorial in washington dc how that structure was created and it's artistic but it had to be engineered in order to stand and have and the and the a lot of the sculptures that people do are, are engineered like how do you get a hand to stick out of a stone and stay there yeah. and that is really interesting if you compare that to what you did because your structure is artistically beautiful your piece is beautiful and it sounds beautiful and it was engineered. So I just, I wanted to make that point. I thought that was a, a cool thing that was going through my head as I listened to yeah, That's really interesting. Think about the, just the architecture in general too. The, the architect comes up with the shape of a building and maybe the interior functions of it, but then a structural engineer has to figure out where do the beams go to, to make it stand up? How do you build that? How do you take this, precise artistic shape and actually make it realizable in the world like where are the what are the tricks what are the, the sneaky places that you can stick structure into an artistic form to to make it to make the hand That's stick out to make the, yeah. <laughs> and buildings are built like large buildings are built on these days on what they call cores and the core usually if there's an elevator in the building the elevators are located in cores the the emergency egress stairway that goes through it is a core of the building and also a lot of the utilities and infrastructure the plumbing the electrical of the building go up through that core so if you see a building being built the cores are usually what go up first um, just when they're constructing it and even though they may not have been the, it, part of the original design of the architect's vision for the building they need to be there functionally and structurally and they go up first and they're also fire isolated and then the rest of the structure gets 
attached to that as they get filled, which is also very similar to what the, the composing process is in a way. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Well, that was a great session. <laughs> I thought we covered a lot of interesting points and raised some really, I think, interesting metaphors or analogies between mm -hmm musical composing process and other arts and, and engineering. So, so thank you for that. <laughs>